Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In this lecture which is the last lecture, I will be telling you about final finishing operations. You know, from the ore, iron ore, we have cast steel through several successive methods. Casting, we did rolling and we got the product for a particular application. Now, the final finishing operations are needed in order to generate or create a property that is required for a particular application. So, in fact, the objective, in fact, the objective of final finishing operations are to generate or create mechanical property, mechanical property or properties as required for a particular application. Now, what mechanical properties are we looking? For example, strength. Strength. This is the measure of the resistance of material, measure of the resistance of material to permanent deformation to permanent deformation. That is, we are looking a product which should have high strength or should have high ductility. What is ductility? The ductility is a measure of the plastic deformation measure of the plastic deformation that has been sustained till fracture, that has been sustained at fracture, that is what the property we are looking for or hardness. resistance to localized plastic deformation, these are some of the properties, mechanical properties of the, I listed, some of the corrosion properties, some of the uh, all whatever properties you require for your application. In order to get those properties, final finishing operations are being done. The requirements are enormous. There are requirements for low tech industry, for example, construction industry to SIS for the high tech industry that is the aircraft application. So, accordingly, the finishing operations are to be carried out or are to be carried out in order to generate or create that property. Now, the question that comes to my mind, how I can generate or create a required property in a material? I want a soft material, what should I do? I want a hard material, 
what should I do? I want a ductile material, I want a corrosion resistant material, what should I do? Because the product which I am getting from the rolling mill, it does not meet my requirement, so what should I do? Or other, in what way I should think or what should be my direction of thinking in order to create or generate that property. Now, mind you, I am using the term create or generate. That means, there must be something which can lead to creation or generation of a particular property. How to get that? Easiest way to get that? You open a material and see what the material consists of. With that, I mean, I put before you four steel samples and I say one is hard, one is soft, one is brittle, another is ductile. Can you tell me from the external appearance which is hard, which is soft, which is ductile, which is brittle? Unless I tell you this is this, this is this, this is this, this is you cannot tell just by seeing the material. Then, how to create or how to generate or how to know to induce a particular property? As I have said just before, you have to open the material. What does it mean? You have to open the material, you have to polish it you have to etch it and you have to see under the microscope. All of you have gone through a course on phase diagram and phase transformation. You can appreciate, if I open the material, I polish it and I see under the microscope that could be optical or could be scanning or whatever the microscope may be, then you will be confronted with a different type of structures in the material. And if you analyze those structures, you will get a clue. The property which you are looking for is generated through the phases that are present in the material. So, what I want to say from here that a property or an individual property that is required for a particular application, it depends upon the phases which the material consists of. In short, if you see the microstructure, you will find it consists of grains, it consists of grain boundaries. There could be small size grains and larger grain boundaries. There could be larger size grains, but the smaller grain boundary. There could be different phases. The distribution of phases could be different. The morphology of the phases could be different. So, if I combine all the inside story of the material that is after seeing under the microscope and if I apply to the iron carbon system, then I get the following picture. The type of phase, number of phase, number of phase, size and size distribution of phases. size and size distribution of phases and morphology and morphology they constitute the required property in a given material if i see now the iron carbon system Remember, in my first lecture, I have told you that iron carbon is a unique system to which steel belongs. It is unique in the sense, it has a capability 
to have some solubility for element and create that property. Now, I will show you how it can be done. If I see now the equilibrium phase diagram of iron carbon, I notice there are two phases are present at room temperature. Austenite is a high temperature phase. So, at room temperature, I have ferrite plus cementite. Ferrite is ductile, cementite is harder and brittle than ferrite and brittle than ferrite. Ferrite is ductile. Increasing the proportion of cementite in a material, what will it do? It will make the steel more harder and brittle. So, here itself I am getting a clue that if I vary the proportion of cementite in a simple iron carbon phase diagram, I can get different type of materials. Now, imagine if I change the morphology of the cementite. Imagine I change the size of the phases, I change the number of phases by some manipulation, if I am able to generate more number of phases, then very different properties I can produce it. So, let us see what are the number of phases or types of phases that can be obtained in an iron carbon system. So, I am listing first phase. Let us say sphero spheroidite. This consists of a small Fe three C spheres in alpha ferrite. What I have done, I am simply modifying the morphology of cementite, getting a phase spherodite, and this phase property is soft and ductile. Soft and ductile. So, this is the property of a phase, and this is how it consists of. Then you must have heard perlite. So, there is a coarse perlite, coarse perlite, and the coarse perlite have alternate, alternate thick layers of layers of ferrite and cementite. This is altogether a different type of phase. This is harder and stronger than spherodite. I can further change the morphology. Say I can get fine perlite, fine perlite. Now, in fine perlite, alternative thin layers of ferrite and cementite. That means, cementite is in thin layers, is in thin layers in ferrite. Now, this hardness and strength, hardness and strength hardness and strength they are greater than coarse per light then another phase i can get which is called bainite the bainite is very fine in bainite you have 
very fine and elongated very fine and elongated particles it's very st special structure of fe3c in alpha ferrite matrix in alpha ferrite matrix now this phase benite has hardness and strength hardness and strength it is greater than fine perlite it is greater than fine perlite but at the same time this phase has ductility ductility which is greater than martensite greater than martensite still another phase i can have that is the martensite martensite phase martensite is a body center tetragonal phase all of you know is a single phase needle shaped needle shape this is a strong and hard and ductility is very poor then i can again get another phase which is tempered martensite tempered martensite now here very small very small fe3c sphere like particles sphere like particles in alpha ferrite matrix now this particular tempered martensite tempered martensite has ductility greater than martensite now you see what i have illustrated over here i have shown you this these are the num these are the type and number of phases that can be obtained in an iron carbon system don't you imagine that an iron carbon system it provides a very large possibility to create the material of different properties all that you should know the application and with 100% confidence i can tell there is a material which is steel so that is what the importance of the steel as a material because it provides a very large number of possibility to create a particular property which is required for a particular application and that you can see these are the number of phases now you see now at seven or eight number of phases now i can vary the size i can vary the distribution also one of the phase that i have not listed is the austenite it is the high temperature phase but as i have said that because of the uniqueness of iron carbon system it has some solubility for an element you can always find an element in a periodic table which can retain austenite at room temperature and you can utilize the ductility of austenite in order to create a very different type of material so summarizing what i want to say is that that it is these number of phases their size their size distribution their morphology if one can change them then one can obtain a very different type of material now just to show about the property for example i just plot schematically say for example i take here say a composition say wet percent carbon it varies from 0 to 1 and here i take for example hardness i take hardness then for for say sphero spheroidite spheroidite this is hardness is the minimum and then 
if you go for cores per light, this is for the cores per light and on the top you have fine per light, that is what I have said also. So, this is how the, the mechanical property vary. Now, if I take ductility, for example, if I plot here now, this scale is same composition weight percent carbon, I take here ductility, it will be reverse of this plot. Say, spheroidite will have the maximum ductility. Spheroidite, then followed by cores per light, followed by cores per light, and uh, this is followed by fine per light. What I mean to say? Naturally, hardness and ductile they do not go together. If a material is very hard, then it will be less ductile. If the material is uh, not that hard, it will be more ductile. Now, also if you can see some other phases, for example, if I plot here the Brinell hardness number against composition, then martensite is the hardest phase, that is the martensite the martensite, then this will be tempered martensite, tempered martensite and this will be fine perlite. Now, those who are interested in more details, they can look down to a book W D Callister, I have given the reference in the end, but still I will give you here material science and engineering, material science and engineering. Now, with this presentation, what I wanted to say is a very simple, that if you want to create a given property for a given application, the application could be anything at the moment, all that you should know what for you want to use that material. Then the iron carbon system, it provides a very large number of possibility to create a property by permutation and combination of the phases which I have listed over here. You can see there is there is a very large permutation and combination and if you include into that permutation and combination size of the phase also becomes one of the important tool to manipulate the property in a material, whether it is for low tech industry or whether it is for high tech industry. So, now possibly you are convinced from my statement of the first lecture that iron carbon it is a unique system to which steel belongs. It has a unique property of allowing with several elements and that is what I meant over here. With this, what I want to say is that all that you should have an application in your mind. My dear friend, you will have before you steel as a material. Now, all that is required and that a question must be coming into your mind, how can I generate these properties? What are the ways in which these properties can be generated? Or it is just simple, I have presented and there is no ways there. No, there are ways these distribution of phases can be obtained and now these properties I can classify into three types of operations. One is the surface finishing operations. surface finishing operation that is where for some applications require only surface property are to be modified and second is the heat treatment and 
and third is the deformation processing. Deformation processing. These are the three different technologies which can be used to proportion the number, size and size distribution, morphology of the phases to obtain a material for a particular application. Now, in short, I will take first for example, surface finishing operations that is in fact, they are called surface hardening. So, first I will take for example, surface hardening. Now, surface hardening consists of two parts, one is a thermochemical, thermochemical surface hardening, surface hardening. Now, one of the important requirement in order to apply these technologies is to heat the steel so that at the heating temperature, the steel should have single phase and the temperature at which the steel will be in a single phase on heating that one can find out from the phase diagram and which depends on the carbon content. I want to say with this that the steel is to be heated so that it comes in the single phase region and that is the austenite from where the transformation to the different phases begin. So, one is the thermochemical surface hardening and in this composition of steel surface is altered. Composition of steel surface is altered and is then hardened with or without quenching. That is all that you require to heat to the austenitic temperature and from here there you can quench or you can uh, any in the, in the air or what depending on the hardness you require. Composition of the steel surface is altered and is hardened and is hardened by quenching or some other treatment. So, here you have the austenitic type, austenitic type or you have ferritic type. Now, ferritic type, the austenitic type they are known as for example, carburizing, carburizing is one such method, carbonitriding is another method, carbonitriding is another method, then cyaniding is another method. In one case you introduce carbon for example, in carburizing, in carbonitriding, carbon and nitrogen and so on. In the ferritic type, it consists of one is nitriding, one is nitriding, then you have nitro carburizing, nitro carburizing. Now, here in this particular austenitic type, the non metallic elements usually carbon singly or in combination with nitrogen are diffused into the austenitic phase. That is why we call them they are the austenitic type thermochemical surface hardening method. That is, carbon and nitrogen they are diffused into the austenitic phase. In the ferritic type, the carbon or carbon plus nitrogen are diffused into the ferrite phase. That is why we call them as a ferritic uh, type of thermochemical surface hardening. Now, another is the thermal surface hardening, thermal surface 
hardening. Now, in the thermal surface hardening, heat alone is used to alter the microstructure without altering the composition. That is, you locally heat it, you require heating and heating can be done either by induction or flame hardening. You know, induction is a very localized heating or flame hardening or you can direct the flame at the part which requires to be heated up. So, induction or flame hardening, induction or flame hardening. Another type of uh, thermal surface hardening could be done or by heating could be done laser or electron beam hardening. Now, the idea of thermal in surface hardening is to heat the localized surface only, such that you form austenite to a controlled depth, which is then quenched in water or oil or forced air to produce hard martensite phase. As I have said in the beginning, in order to alter the number phase, number of phases, size, size distribution morphology and so on, the technology begins first to heat the steel to a single phase region and in most cases that is the austenite that is a single phase. It is from there depending on the rate of cooling, the different type of phases can be generated. So, here in the thermal surface hardening where heating is done to a controlled surface, so care is taken that only that controlled surface is transformed to austenite because you want only surface hardening and depending on the hardness that is required, you have to quench it. If you quench in water, quench in oil, quench in force air, you get a varying degree of hardness in the uh, steel. So, that is what this surface hardening method. Now, the advantages over thorough hardening method is advantages advantages over through hardening, the one advantage is that reduction in distortion, reduction in distortion, elimination of cracking and elimination of cracking especially in large components. Second, fatigue life, fatigue life and fatigue strength, fatigue life and fatigue strength are increased due to compressive stresses in the outer layers. Third, a high wear resistant surface is produced, a high wear resistant surface is produced. These are the advantages of surface hardening method. Fourth, selected areas can be hardened. Selected areas can be hardened. Now, say these are the sum of the surface hardening methods. So, next important technology is deformation processing. 
in the deformation processing, you have to apply the load or you have to deform the material. So, you have a such cold working and hot working. Cold working is done below recrystallization temperature, hot working is done above recrystallization temperature. Advantages of cold working, say no heating is required, no heating is required, better surface finish. better surface finish and dimensional control can also be achieved. Then strength, fatigue and wear properties are improved and wear properties are improved. Then directional properties can be imparted. Directional properties can be imparted. Directional properties can be imparted. Some of the disadvantages, heavier forces are required. Heavier forces are required because you are working in the cold stage then strain hardening may occur. Strain hardening may occur and this strain hardening requires then to anneal them to relieve the material from stresses. Then some residual stresses may be produced, some residual stresses may be obtained during the cold working operation and if care is not taken, then one may have a problem in the application stage. Now, as regards the hot working, heating is required, but natural there is no need to write, heating is required, but there are certain advantages associated with the hot working. Hot working, it does not produce strain hardening, does not produce strain hardening. Hard working can be used to drastically alter the shapes without fear of fracture and excessive high forces, because you do not need to apply high forces. Then at elevated temperatures what can happen? The diffusion processes are accelerated and as a result, a certain pores are there, certain inhomogeneities in the material is there, they can also be reduced. So, that means chemical inhomogeneities, chemical inhomogeneities can be reduced. Pores can also be welded up or reduced in size during deformation. Then the dendritic structure, dendritic grain structure small gas cavities, shrinkage porosity formed during solidification in large sections can be modified during hot working to produce a fine randomly oriented spherical shaped grains which results in better properties. Then hot working also results in reorientation of inclusions, I will just put in short reorientation of inclusions. Now, one of the say important requirement for cold working to be successful is that the stress strain diagram of the material should show a high strain for a particular stress. That means, the material should be ductile and easily deformable. If the material is brittle, 
then there is a the limited amount of force that can be applied under cold conditions. There are several operations for cold working as well as hot working, rolling, extrusion, then sheet metal working, hot rolling, all these are the operations and uh, you can study them and see that you know it. Another important technology as I said is the heat treatment. Now, heat treatment consists of heating and then cooling. Heating to what temperature? The foremost requirement for surface finishing operation or for the bulk finishing operation is to heat the material to a single phase range that is the austenitic temperature. So, the heat treatment operation consists of heating the material to the austenitic range and from there it is cooled at a different rate. And there are several type of heat treatment procedures. One is the annealing, that you heat and cool the material in furnace itself. Then another treatment is normalizing. You heat the material again to the austenitic range and cool in air. Then third is quenching. Here material is heated again to the austenitic range, then it is rapidly cooled in water. So, in all the three methods, there will be different phases will form. Of course, it will depend upon the carbon content also. In between this, you can have the several modified practices for heat treatment. For example, one is mar tempering. then aus tempering, because you want to get a phase benite to make use of the properties of the benite for their aus tempering is done. Then also tempering is done, say after quenching large amount of stresses are induced in the material, then the stresses are to be relieved, are to be relieved and for that purpose the material is reheated. So, these are some of the technologies that belong to heat treatment. Oh, now, I will uh, like to give you certain questions and references. Here are the questions for self assessment. What is the difference between plane front and dendritic solidification? Explain. I had already explained. I do not think now you want any explanation from me. Second, explain constitutional supercooling, what is the importance in relation to solidification of steel melt. Third, discuss the solidification of killed and rimming steel in an ingot mold. Well, you have to tell here how both types of ingot solidifies, a pipe formation, blow hole and so on. It would be better if you answer the question by drawing sketches. Why is there formation of pipe during solidification of killed steel in ingot during continuous cast during ingot casting practice? How pipe formation can be controlled? What is rimming? And next question explain the difference between ingot and continuous casting that is I have said already. Seventh question with the help of a neat sketch, describe the process of continuous casting steel. Try to draw a sketch, write short notes on the following. Well, that has been said. Ninth question is that. You are, you are continuously casting slab of cross section 200 into 2000 millimeter at 2 meter per minute speed. Now, you are required to cast at 4 meter per minute casting speed to cater the enhanced capacity of hot strip mill. What technological modifications are needed to be done? Discuss. I have taken an example. Now, this question you can, you can, you can modify with the uh, discussion that we have and you can provide the answer here. What is the principle of creating different mechanical properties on steel? Name the methods to achieve them. Right now, I discuss, and these are the references for further reading to strengthen your knowledge. So, with this, I want to end my lecture by telling. In fact, I will be repeating my few sentences of my first lecture. There, I have said that steel belongs to iron carbon system. 
and iron carbon system has a unique property and now you have seen the uniqueness of iron carbon system and believe me or not it is the creation of the nature nature has made iron to be magnetic so that it is ductile at room temperature otherwise it would have been hexagonal plaque close plaque structure do not you think it is a wonder of the nature? Another that I want to say is that as I have said also, steel provides enormous application oriented development of the material. On the top of it, nature has also given steel or nature has also made steel to be recyclable. My dear friends, I conclude the lecture by telling steel is a green 